I don't have time. Now, how many of you have heard this phrase over two times a day? By show of hands. <laughs> okay. Now, how many of you actually say it? Okay. <laughs> well, you're not alone. As a student who can't stop signing up for extracurriculars and maintaining a diversified and balanced life, I've been known for this phrase. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. I mean, you really don't have time. But what do you mean when you say you don't have time? What is your perception of time? Every time I would hear someone say this phrase, I would try to conclude how they perceive time to be. It usually follows, time is running out and there's a lot left to do. Now, these people view time differently than those that follow up saying, although it's never ending, I just can't seem to find it. Now, the first respondents view time as something you can take a hold of and control its pace according to your life. While the second respondents view it as more of a track star. They might even name it Usain Bolt rather than time. Now, when we view these different perceptions, how do we know how to view time? Why is it even important to attempt to comprehend it? Time is the fabric of life. And unfortunately, not many people understand this essence. People have the common misconception that time is a social construct. The measurement of time being the social construct. Just to be clear before we begin, the measurement of time is not a social construct. Only our perception of it is. Now today, I've decided to give you my perception of time, according to several calculated factors. I view time as being too complicated to be explained in just one sentence. So, to fully explore it, we have to discover all its aspects. There's a philosophical aspect and a physical one. And before I proceed, I just have to warn you that I'm a huge Stephen Hawking fan, so expect to see my budding romance for him throughout my presentation. Now, for all the analytical minds out there, we'll start by exploring the physical aspect. Now, in order to get into the topic, we have to first split our common conception into two. The measurement of time, which I just mentioned is not a social construct, and our perception of it, which is. Now, in order to get into the physical aspect, we're just going to look at the first part of the misconception, which is the measurement of time. Now, in order to, because I know that physics can be a bit challenging and it isn't really an all-time favorite, we're going to create a simple model for time. Now, I want you to imagine that time is three simple arrows. Now, the first arrow being the arrow of disorder. It basically states that as time flows by, disorder in the universe increases. This can be modeled in our everyday life by, for example, having a table and a glass cup on it. If someone is just passing by and, well, accidentally bumps into the table, the glass will consequently fall and shatter to pieces. Now, these shattered pieces represent the resultant disorder. There are more safety hazards and the cup isn't intact and can't hold any liquids, which was quite contrary to what it was designed to do. So now we can see the resultant disorder. Now, you might be wondering, why is everything always doomed for disorder and nothing barely regains order? This is because the possibilities of disorder greatly outnumber the ordered ones, which will be, we will be exploring later. However, you also might be wondering, when I build a skyscraper, for example, that I'm defying the laws of physics and I'm gathering a couple of disordered materials and putting them into an ordered state. Well, you might be increasing the order of that one little case, but at what expense? You burn the energy in your body and therefore causing yourself disorder. You burn fuels for combustion and therefore causing an increase in disorder in the universe. Now, in order to better understand the ratio of disorder against ordered states, we can take another simple example. Now, I want you to imagine that you have a box of puzzles. As we know from puzzles that there is only one state or possibility in which the puzzles complete an ordered picture and is, an, and is in an ordered state. But how many disordered states are there, can there be? So the more we keep shaking the box, the more the puzzle pieces scatter and the more we move away from that one ordered state. But I want you to just take a guess and try to imagine how many possibilities the puzzles can exist in other than that one full and ordered picture. So now I have four puzzles, so just try to brainstorm for a while how many possibilities it can exist in. I'll give you a minute. Yeah. Four, okay, does anyone have any other guesses? Oh, okay, are you guys keeping up? Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, so if you're gonna take a look at it, I have one, two, three, four puzzle pieces. 
and how many places can it exist in, or how many spaces are there? Four, exactly. So we take the number of puzzle pieces powered by the number of places it can exist in. So now we have the disordered possibilities, four to the power of four, as opposed to that one ordered state. So now we can see how an, as an object usually wants to move to the disordered possibilities because they just simply outnumber the ordered ones. There is four to the power of four disordered possibilities, yet only one ordered. Now, in order to fully explore the aspect, we also have to look at the second arrow, which is the psychological arrow of time. Now, this arrow is related to how we, as intelligent beings, view the universe. Now, the disorder, the disorder arrow and the psychological arrow have to be pointing in the same direction. If they weren't, we, we would be viewing life in reverse. We would see the glass pieces gather themselves from the floor and get placed on the table. We would basically see the future before the present, before the past, and be able to predict the stock market and make millions. We would actually die before we live, before we're born. And since we don't witness any of this, we know for a fact that this, the disorder arrow is pointing in the same direction as a psychological one. You know, it is actually theorized that the universe is actually expanding. Since it's expanding, there will come a point where it will stop and then start contracting. This is referred to as the big crunch. Now, during this phase, the psychological arrow will be looking in the opposite direction than the disordered ones, and we will, in fact, be seeing life in reverse. Now, in order to, again, get a broader view, we have to take a look at the third arrow, which is the universal arrow of time. Now, I don't really want to go into the arrow that much and explore it in detail because it's going to take us to a whole other pool of topics. But simply put, the universal arrow basically states that as time flows by, the universe expands and uh, life goes on. So basically, we come, to, we come to the conclusion that the three arrows have to be pointing in the same direction. If they weren't, we wouldn't be witnessing life as we do now. Okay, are you guys ready for the next topic? Yeah? Okay. So, if you thought that comparing an abstract concept to three arrows was weird, hearing how it relates to gravity is a whole other level. Now, to make things simpler, we're going to relate the concept to the movie Interstellar. Now, who here has watched the movie? Okay. Now, I'm sure most of you love this movie. However, to those who haven't seen it, it's basically about a man who goes on a mission in outer space in order to explore or find a new home for humans since Earth has become uninhabitable. He succeeds in aiding his daughter discover the secret of life, but ends up coming or returning back to Earth younger than his own daughter. Now, in order to explain what happens, or what happened that he came back younger than his own daughter, we have to explore Einstein's theory of relativity. Now, thanks to Einstein, we discovered that gravity is not merely a pull, but an acceleration. It depends on how you accelerate and how, your how you feel your acceleration is going. Now, after we discovered that, we also discovered that when a person uh, approaches a high gravitational field, their time changes. This is as a result of their change in acceleration, which results in their change in time. So for example, if we have an astronaut approaching a black hole, given that he doesn't die for several reasons, um, we can actually witness that his time flows differently than ours. Oh, and by the way, a black hole is a body in space, which has a huge amount of gravitational field that light can't even escape it. Now, as the astronaut approaches the black hole, his time will continue to work normally. To him, it's the same. But to us as observers from Earth, when we look at his clock, he is in, the, he is in a different circumstance. And so we see that his clock moves slower and slower and slower and slower. And so as we approach a higher gravitational field, time moves a lot slower. The second turns into what seems like years. However, here is where the misconception occurs. The second turns into what seems like years, yes. But not for the astronauts, for us as observers from Earth, from another circumstance. You never notice a difference unless you look at someone else's position in space. Okay, so um, now we're done with the physics part, so any person who doesn't like physics, you're going to be happy. <laughs> we're going to move on to the philosophical part. And in order uh, to get into that part, we have to look at the second part of our misconception, which, uh, which is our perception of time. So now we have reached um, the knowledge that time, there is no universal clock, and the measurement of time isn't definite. We also know that time 
is not a social construct because it wasn't just waiting around for humans to get existed and bring it into existence as well. Time has existed long before we have. It's just like, for example, having a baby. If the baby is born yet hasn't been named yet, does this mean it doesn't exist? Well, exactly. It's the same case with time. Now, when we are going to look at the, the percep our perception of time, we also have to consider uh, a certain experiment that was created, which was about a woman who was locked in an underground cellar for days, with no light going in or out. She had no feeling about the passage of time. Now, in order to, to be able to understand the dire situation, uh, or the importance of the situation, we're going to have to go back to our introduction. Now, we base all our lives on time. However, what about a town that has the sun only rise once per year and sets only once per year? The Norwegian town Somoroi apparently think time is unnecessary and they try to abolish it all together. They actually signed a petition to get rid of time. They thought of the idea as, the way, as a way that the keepers can open the shops whenever they'd liked, or life would be more free. However, I just want you to take a moment and think if this would be a logical way of life. First of all, the, the town has only about 320 residents, so nothing can be applied to big cities. Our bodies have also gotten used to the 24-hour rhythm. We simply wouldn't survive without time, just like the woman couldn't survive without the feeling of passage of time. Now, in order to explain what has happened to her, we have to imagine that humans have a clock inside their minds, which keeps track, with, uh, keeps track of the passage of time in accordance to, accordance to our biology and our sleep. Uh, you can actually witness its job when you set an alarm at 6 a.m. and find you waking your own self up at 5.55. Now, this woman, after conducting the experiment, it was found that her circadian clock, which is the clock I just mentioned, was completely messed up, and her biology got completely messed up as well. So therefore, we can see the importance of having time and feeling its passage. Now, there is another question that you might be thinking about. If we have a clock inside our mind, why do we not feel time passing by in our sleep, for example? Now, scientifically, it was discovered that when we are sleep deprived, we go into a REM retrieval phase. So our brain is so focused on retrieving that REM that it doesn't even feel time passing by. It's just like focusing on a task too much that you don't feel like you spent so much time on it. Now it's the same thing. However, might it be that our soul goes into a whole other dimension? A dimension where time doesn't even exist? You know, I actually had a theory for a while, but it's my own theory, so it's nothing definite or anything, that part of our soul leaves our body and goes to the location of dreams. Now, in this place, our soul meets other souls and therefore has them portrayed in our dreams and memories. Now, although we, science will never be able to explain uh, how we feel time passing differently in our sleep, and possibly we will never know the answer, this merely shows us how deceiving time can be. We can never really understand it or its aspects. However, we only attempt to. Now, if we're going to also look at um, time in relation to our emotions, we can feel our perception of time and how we are in control of it. Like, for example, if you love a person, you feel like you want to give them all your time because it passes by so quickly and so beautifully with them. However, when you're sitting with a person you dislike, you feel like time is endless. It also has many phases, or we can, we can witness its multiple phases through our daily actions. When you come to think about it, there can be two people sitting in the same place, at the same time, and with the same people, yet experience time totally differently. Now, it's just like Einstein said. When you sit with a nice girl for two hours, you think it's only a minute. But when you sit on a hot stove for a minute, you think it's two hours. That's relativity. Now, what we can conclude from all this is that time is too broad and too complex to understand. Even with all our research, we can't even begin to say that we understand it or the universe. This is what we have gotten from years of research by brilliant minds and, well, in this talk, from my point of view as well. But there is a lot left to explore. Basically, time is messed up, but in a gorgeous way.